Hey, my name's Gabby. Today we're going to be talking about queer comics that changed my life. Two things about me. I am a comics artist and I am a queer. I'm transgender and I'm bisexual. I am all genders and I like all genders. That's a joke. I'm trans -basque. I'm a man. Nice to meet you. So the comics that I'm bringing up today, I'm not exaggerating. There is a marked difference between before I read each of these comics and after I read each of these comics. Now I'm telling you, I highly recommend that you read them. We'll get into the reasons why, but first let's just start with the very first one. So some background on me. I went to Catholic school and I was raised Catholic. Like to the level where I wasn't allowed to say the title of the film, The 40 Year Old Virgin. Brokeback Mountain was a no in my house. My parents watched it and then they took the DVD and kept it in their room in a locked drawer. So we were not allowed to know about or talk about sexuality or gayness at all. I didn't grow up in a very healthy home. So after school, sometimes I would just hang out in the library for as long as possible. And they had a section in this Catholic school dedicated to graphic novels. And I ate that shit up. Oh, I ate that shit up. And the first one that I really, really loved was the book called Emiko Superstar. This book is by Mariko Tamaki, who's a very famous comics artist, along with her cousin, Jillian Tamaki. They collaborate a lot. They did a comic called This One Summer, which I think is just absolutely out of this world. Emiko Superstar is the only one of the queer comics that changed my life that I don't actually own. And I don't think I need to, because the time that this book changed my life, I was about 15 years old. I was 15 years old, and like I said, I wasn't supposed to know about gay shit. And so I didn't really mark Emiko as a queer comic at the time. But now, looking back with my grown-up eyes, I think Emiko for sure is a lesbian. And there are actual lesbians in the book. I remember looking at them with, like, kind of fear, kind of curiosity, and revulsion also. Because, you know, it was the way I was raised. In the comic, without giving too much away, Emiko ends up finding about these parties that are based on the Andy Warhol factory parties. And she starts going to them. And at these parties, people are very free to be themselves. And so Emiko is inspired to start being herself, too being different from how her parents and her friends expect her to be at home and at school. So she shaves the back of her head, and when she shows up to these parties, she pulls her hair up. So in most of her daily life, no one knows that it's shaved. But here at these parties, everyone can see that she's just got that little bit of herself coming out. She hurts a lot of people in the course of this book by pretending to be cooler than she is and trying to fit in with people. And I thought that was a really important lesson as a 15 year old. I saw a lot of myself in Emiko. I actually started the Facebook page for Emiko Superstar because I was a really big fan of the book and there wasn't a Facebook page at the time that I read it in about 2008. So I am the official owner of the Emiko Superstar Facebook page. Thank you very much. Like I said, I saw a lot of myself in Emiko and I actually ended up shaving the back of my head in secret so that at school or whenever I needed a pick-me-up of some kind alone in my room, I would pull my hair up and know some little part of me, some little part that's not supposed to be there is there. I could show it off to myself when I wanted to. And I think I kept the back of my head shaved for three years. And occasionally in my adolescence between the ages of 15 and probably 21, I would just shave the back of my head again every time that it grew in and I needed a little pick-me-up of some kind, a little reminder that I am who I am. Later on, as I got older and bolder, I would shave my whole fucking head anytime I needed a pick-me-up. But for a while, Emiko was really there for me. Like I said, I think she's gay. I think it's a very queer novel, but I haven't read it since high school and I don't think I need to read it anymore. But it did change my life. I was different after Emiko. It did give me a little piece of myself that I would keep for the rest of my life. And for that, I'm very thankful to Mariko Tamaki. Thank you very much. That book did a lot for me. Okay, that's the first one, Emiko Superstar. The second one. The second graphic novel is this one, The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wang. Girl, look, it was 10 years later. I was 25, so this came out in 2018, and this was the next queer comic that changed my life. I mean, it's worth getting just because, well, besides for the incredible story. In the back, Jen Wang goes through her process and explains how to make comics, and for that, I mean, just that alone by the book. But this story to me is T for T. Now, I don't know if that's what Jen Wang intended, but it is for sure, for me, as a trans person, this story is T for T. At the time, I did not know I was trans. Like I said, I didn't really figure it out until I was 28. But something stirred. Something stirred for sure. It was the beginning of something. Because the dressmaker, 
she felt like me. <laughs> now for a person like me who related only to characters like Arya Stark from Game of Thrones, not the TV show, but the book specifically, The Murderous Child, I related to Arya Stark, I related to Fang from Dave the Barbarian, and I related to Buttercup from Powerpuff Girls. If you also relate to female characters like that, I got news for you. But as a person who related to trans-coded or queer-coded female characters, she tripped me in the same way. If you don't know what the story is about, The Prince and the Dressmaker is about a young prince who invites a dressmaker over to his palace because he really likes to wear dresses. The dressmaker falls in love with the prince, both as the prince and as Lady Crystallia, his alter ego, his drag ego, his gender fluid female self, who knows? But she falls in love with him both ways. And I had never encountered that before. Like I said, I didn't know I was trans. I didn't really have a lot of trans friends. I didn't hadn't consumed a lot of trans media but something stirred something about this was a really special story to me in my experience for what i relate to the story felt very t for t very trans for trans and i actually had a short romance with a person who i think is trans and reminded me a lot of the prince and it was special in ways in ways that it is in this book and so at the time that i was reading this book and experiencing that very particular kind of love, it kind of was a really special little thing for me. I think, yeah, I think The Prince and the Dressmaker is T for T, and I think that me recognizing that without really realizing what I was recognizing allowed me to open up and become parts of myself that I didn't know I was before reading this book. I didn't really know I was trans after reading this book. I mean, they're not explicitly trans in the book, but there are hints. There are clues. They're kids, you know? They're kids. But there are hints and there are clues. Even if I didn't have the language, I did know that I was the dressmaker and I loved the prince. That's the prince and the dressmaker. It's a masterpiece. It's beautiful. When I worked at Disney, I knew friends who had like signed pieces of the book and signed illustrations that they'd wanted auctions and stuff. Just really special. Everybody, I mean, everybody who's read this book loves this book. I really recommend that you read it. A lot of the times you can find it at your local library because it's that popular. And thank you, Jen Wang, for making that book because it really did a lot for me. Before we move on to the third one, I'm just going to show you a couple of pages from the book. This one, beautiful. This one, that's the princess, Lady Crystallia. And then this one, just special. Just read it read it go out and find it and read it okay that's the prince and the dressmaker i consider it my initiation into trans awakening and now speaking of trans awakening and trans awakening books i'm gonna have to introduce you to the runner-up it's called the fire never goes out by nd stevenson or nate stevenson now the reason that this is a runner-up is because it didn't necessarily change my life because by the time i read this book i knew a lot about myself i knew i was trans i knew i was gay I knew it was gay in every single direction a person can be gay. But Nate Stevenson was a contemporary of mine. He started making comics at the time that I was making comics. He's just barely older than me. He started working in animation around the time that I started working in animation. And so seeing him grow into himself, he's also trans, has been a privilege, an absolute privilege. And in this book, this is Nate's memoirs. They go back as far as 2011, when he was, I think, 18 years old. And I mean, he was a brilliant comic artist the entire time, but it starts with this feeling that I think a lot of trans people have this fire feeling where you just feel like something's off or wrong or burning and it just never goes away. There's just something about you that, I mean, Nate had it worse than me. He had a lot of pressure on him as a young Eisner nominated comics artist, but it goes all the way up through his transition his marriage to his beautiful wife or beautiful spouse and his relationship to himself as a young queer person who then became a young queer trans person. I think if I had read this book earlier, this would have definitely been one of my top three queer books that changed my life. But seeing as I only read it last year, it was just kind of a an acknowledgement. Me reading Nate's book felt very like you and me, both, both of us, Nate. Nate is a is a great resource for trans mask people and trans people in general, for trans comic artists and queer comic artists. I highly recommend reading everything that Nate's ever done. In fact, Nate did Nimona back in the day. 
way back in the day. Nate started a comic called Nimona that I was reading online at the time. It makes a lot of sense now to me why I related to Nimona. Because Nimona, I think, was a trans allegory without Nate knowing that Nimona was a trans allegory. As a trans person, as a trans mask person, you don't really have anybody else's experience to go off of but your own. And so when we say write what you know, I mean, my comic character, Eleanor, is also trans. I didn't realize she was trans until I learned that I was trans. But the problems that she had were all of the problems that I had. And so in thinking that I was a cis girl, I of course thought that Eleanor was a cis girl. And similarly, I bet that Nate thought that Nimona was a cis girl. When the actuality is that Nimona, spoilers if you haven't read it, doesn't really have an identity, like a clear form. She doesn't really have an, a default which I think I related to a lot as a trans person. Who are you outside of your body? If your body can change, then who are you really? I think Nimona is a really accurate depiction of what a young trans person feels. I mean, for me, at least, that kind of who am I, what am I, when I'm not this thing that I'm presenting myself as in order for people to like and accept me. If I'm not this acceptable thing that I have to pretend to be, then who am I besides that? outside of that and inside of that. What do I really look like? And so it's a beautiful found family story where Ballister and Goldenloin accept Nimona for who she is and love her for exactly who she is and fight anybody who doesn't feel that way about Nimona. Anybody who wants to harm her and call her a monster, they protect her from that because they are her family now. So Nimona I also really recommend. And also, especially if you're a young queer, The Fire Never Goes Out is a really good one. But if you're a millennial queer like me, or you're around the same age as Nate, it's just good to get some perspective on a comic artist that I've loved my entire youth and adolescence into adulthood. A lot of respect for Nate. Nate, killer comic artist, killer animator, great showrunner, cool stuff. I like the dude, great dude. <laughs> so thank you very much to Nate for making Nimona and for publishing The Fire Never Goes Out. Like I said, it's a runner up because I knew enough about myself that it didn't actually knock me into learning about myself, but it was a beautiful way of reconnecting with an artist I've known the entire time. Thank you, Nate. Now with queer comics, I get a lot of recommendations for young adult queer comics, of which there are a ton now and for which I'm very grateful because when I was coming up, we didn't have a lot of queer young comics that were easily accessible in bookstores. I mean, that has always been part of the subculture. That's always been part of the indie scene. There have always been queers in comics and trans people in comics who have always been telling their stories and loudly telling their stories too. One of my favorites is actually called Pregnant Butch. I read that book because the idea of being a dad to me is very cool. I think I'd be great at it, but the idea of being pregnant to me is terrifying and dysphoric. So I started looking for books by adult trans people who talked about the experience of being a man who gives birth. And Pregnant Butch was a really, really good one to read because in it, the author explains their experience as a person who presents male and had a baby. Something that really helped me was he talks about when he was very pregnant, he just looked like a plumber. He just looked like a plumber. He had a big old belly and he ended up giving birth to his baby just fine and being a really, really great parent. Now look, don't get me wrong, I love queer young adult stories. I write a fucking queer young adult story. But for me, the story that I write and the stories that I read in that vein are very much for kids and teens who need representation to show that they are perfectly okay exactly as they are. But also for the inner child in all of us who didn't get that kind of representation when we were kids. For the bits and pieces of us who are still young and trying to figure it out and a little confused and a little scared. That's who I write the comic for. That's what I read the comics for. But me, as an adult queer, I still need guidance. And so I specifically look for books by adult queers that are a very, very heavy adult themes. I'm talking institutionalization. I'm talking about alcoholism. I'm talking about abuse and recovery from abuse, uncovering trauma, therapy. Those are the themes that I like. And I don't mean just like as a Oh, it's my first time trying therapy. I mean, like, I want adults who are healing and it's hard. That's what I want to see. Queer adults in those situations. And for that, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about the number one comic that changed my life. I saved it for last because it's the most important to me. And this is 
the entirety of the works by Nagatakabi. I own all of them that are out so far. I started with this one, My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness. You may have heard about this one. I got it at Silver Sprocket, which is my local comic shop. It's also a really cool super punk comic shop. They sell online, so buy from Silver Sprocket or your local indie comic shop. I found this because I was looking for mangas to read and my lesbian experience with loneliness was in the queer manga section. And how can you, with a title like that, how could you pass that up? I ended up actually loving these comics so much that I based my current series of diary comics off of Nagatakabi's format. So this like four panel long horizontal is how I do my comics now. This is kind of an expose about Nagatakabi's life. I actually read this for the first time last year when I picked it up from my local comic shop on a whim. And in this book, Nagatakabi swears up and down that she was not a victim of domestic violence, even though she displays characteristics of a child who was a victim of domestic violence. At the time, I took that at face value. But upon revisiting this book this year, when I started my mental health journey and started uncovering my own history with child abuse, it became very clear to me that Nagatakabi is definitely a victim of domestic violence. She swears up and down that it wasn't the case, but in her subsequent books, it's very evident that she grew up in not that great a home and a home that was similar to mine. The most telling one, you talk about institutionalization, you talk about alcoholism. Her third book, My Alcoholic Escape from Reality. This is really heavy. Like be careful, trigger warning if you read this one because in it she talks about being sexually molested as a child. And she also talks about being institutionalized against her will and self-harming and her feelings about her parents and all of these really, really dark themes. Nagatakabi has like serious mental health problems. It's not her real name. That's a pseudonym that she uses. She also publishes comics under her real name as a manga artist. But she talks about autobiographical comics and how she waffles back and forth on her relationship with her parents, on getting out of her abusive home as an adult in her 30s, on finally exploring her sexuality and her gender. Now, Nagatakabi doesn't explicitly identify as a gender fluid lesbian, but she talks in the comic about how she is gender fluid and a lesbian. She talks about being attracted only to women, and she talks about wearing boxers and liking to be seen as a man. These are things that are really, really taboo still in Japan. So the fact that she's talking about it openly is really fucking cool, like really cool. I have so much respect and admiration for this comic artist. She talks really, really in depth about her struggles with her mental health. She does not pull any punches. She talks at length about how she's hurting her family by telling her story and telling what happened to her as a kid, talking about her relationship with her parents and the home and about how people mistreat and abuse her still to this day. And that for me was very inspiring for me to start telling my own story, for me to start talking about my own abuses in my bio family. It's scary. It's really scary to talk. It's really scary to talk about it. But in reading Nagatakabi's books, I found courage. And so for that, I'm extremely grateful to this comic artist. Now, it is a queer comic because the very first one, My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, she hires a lesbian escort and finds, without spoiling too much of it, that sexuality is high level advanced communication that you can't just jump into having sex with a person when you've not mastered the basics of being a person yet it's a beautiful beautiful comic all of them are beautiful comics the one that i recommend the most my wandering warrior existence this is the one where she talks about being molested as a child trigger warning she rented a wedding dress and had a little wedding for just herself and she thought that it would make her feel really good but it actually made her sad how she thinks she might want a relationship with somebody but then isn't really sure if she does and then in this one my alcoholic escape from reality she reveals to the audience and to her editors for the very first time that she is actually an alcoholic and that it's so bad that she gets pancreatitis and is forbidden from eating certain foods ever again because it could kill her so like I said, I read this book for the first time last year, and I thought it was a beautiful book, but it didn't change my life. I mean, it was a good book, but I'd gotten a bunch of others in the same trip to Silver Sprocket, and so it was just one of quite a few that I liked from that trip. But this book really did change my life about four months ago, when I started to realize that Nagatakabi's family is a lot like my family, and that the things that she was suffering from was a result of the way that she grew up. I also realized in rereading all of her books, she was helping a lot of people by being very honest. 
She was helping me. I went to therapy because of Nagatakabi's books. I brought them to my therapist and explained them to my therapist. And it was in reading her books that I realized I really did need help, that I couldn't do it by myself. Because I couldn't be stuck in the same cycle that she was stuck in, where she was self-medicating and getting better and getting worse and getting better and getting worse. Going to hospital, being institutionalized, being sent home to her abusive home, and then trying to get out on her own. I realized I don't want to do that. And so Nagatakabi's books helped me a lot. And I think they help a lot of people. I recommend them to a lot of people. I've recommended them to my therapist. So hopefully my therapist is recommending them to other people in situations like mine and like Nagatakabi's as well. I think these are books that make you feel less alone. If you've been through trauma, especially as a child, and if you deal with heavy, heavy shit, Nagatakabi does a really, really good job of destigmatizing and showing you everything. The good, the bad, the fucked up, and the really, really ugly. She does not shy away from any of it. And in that, I saw a lot of myself. I was able to see all of the dark shit that I was hiding from me. And she talks in her comics about how she realizes that autobiographical comics are some of the bravest work and some of the most important work that you can do. And her realizing that made me realize that. And so it made me go back to my original conceit for my comics journey, which was memoir comics. I gave myself that name at 12 years old. And I finally went back to drawing my memoirs this year because I realized that if she's helping that many people, fuck, I could help people too, just by processing my own pain and being very visible about it. And so that's why this year I've been very visible about my own pain. And it's doing a lot for me. And it's doing a lot for other people. I'm getting a lot of messages every fucking day of people who see themselves in my story. And for that, we owe a lot to Nagatakavi, both for teaching me who I'm meant to be and for giving me the courage to actually be that person. Ja, Kavi sensei no manga wa domo arigatou gozaimasu. I cannot recommend these books enough. If you are in the mental headspace to view someone else's trauma in a way that is funny and that is lighthearted while also not shying away from any of the pain or the truth. I'll link every single one of her comics. They're all good. The next one comes out in November and you best believe I'm going to order that shit immediately. It's actually an update on the one that discusses her alcoholism and pancreatitis. I'm really excited to see what's been going on in Nagatakavi's life. I kind of dream now of having my own published series of autobio comics in the style of Nagatakabi. Not exactly the same, but similar. So I am working on a new comic book. Oh, I'm really excited about it. I just self-publishing for now, but I really hope that one day I'll physically publish things. Oh, I'm just really excited. So those are my number one queer comics of all time. Those are my gay awakening, trans awakening, therapy awakening comics. Those are the comics that changed my life for good forever. And I really had to pare it down to just a few because you know I love comics. I'd be reading that shit all day, every day. I love queer comics. I love queers. I love trans comics. I love trans comic artists. I just love comics. I just love them. And so in a future video, I'll talk about the queer comics that I love that are just a good old bit of fun. Not the life-changing ones, but the ones that are just, let's sit down and have a gay old time. Those are equally as important, I think. Queer joy is equally as important. <laughs> but thank you for watching. And what I really want to know, what are your gay awakening media? What trans queer gay media did you consume that made you go, hmm, something's a little fishy about me right now? Who did you relate to as a kid growing up? And also, what are your favorite gay and queer comics and trans comics? As always, my comics are going to be at the end of the video and in the description box if you want to read them. Right now, I'm republishing a trauma comic. It's pretty dark, but spoilers, everything ends out okay. The ending is happy and hopeful. That's going to be finishing up in November 2023. And then after that, I'm going to start publishing the diary comics inspired by Nagata Kavi. So as always, my links will be in the description box if you want to read my comics. There'll also be a bibliography at the end where I list all of these comics. I'll also list links to them from Silver Sprocket so you can buy them yourself or find them at your local library. Or sometimes you can even get them digitally on Libby.com, which I'm not affiliated with. I just love the local library. And thanks for watching. Thanks for being here, as always. I hope you have a great week, okay? I'll see you next time. I I enjoy being gay. <laughs> Bye.